Hi and welcome to Philosophy with Phil, with me, Phil Cohen. And for this video, um, I want to talk about Purim and build on a previous video that I did um, about, about Purim, where we talked about the two of the main concepts um, that underlie Purim. And those two concepts were um, randomness and concealment. And feel free to, to watch that video again if, if you want to recap. The two customs I want to talk about, and I should emphasise that they're customs, there are four obligations that we have on Purim, and again, I talk about that those in the, in the previous video. Um, but the two customs that I want to talk about are the custom to um, make a noise, um, and as if to blot out the name uh, Homon when it's read during the Megillah. Um, I should emphasise that the, the hearing or the reading of the Megillah is one big long mitzvah that involves hearing every single one of the words to make up the whole of the mitzvah. Um, and so, you know, yes, make a noise, but, but you should be able to hear the words um, after, after the reader says, says the name. The, that, that's the first custom. The second custom is, is for dressing up. And again, I should emphasise it is just, just a custom. And I want to look at those as two ways of approaching anti-Semitism. How we, how we tackle or approach anti-Semitism. Because after all, that's what Homon represented. Irrational anti-Semitism. In fact, we have the custom to read on the Shabbos before Purim the story of Amalek for Shabbos Zohar. And I should emphasise that is actually a, an obligation and it's very important that as many people as possible are able to hear that. And, and often if you go to shul, the rabbi will make additional readings of that um, to, so that, so that pe everyone, everyone in shul is able to, to do it and to, and to be able to work around the different timings and so on. But why is it important to sort of remember to blot it out, to wipe it out and to call it for what it is? I listened recently to, a, to an interesting TED talk by Deborah Lipstadt. And I don't know if you know about TED, T-E-D dot com. Um, fascinating organisation that arranges speakers from all over the world to talk about subjects related to their area of expertise in about 18 minutes. Um, thoroughly recommend subscribing to their YouTube channel um, and, and listening to some of their talks. Deborah Lipstadt, if, if you know, um, she was the person, she's, there's a film about her called Denial, um, she was the person that was sued by a Holocaust denier um, for her, because she called him a Holocaust denier. She won the case, um, but by doing so, the, the, the film, well, the film goes into details about how, how it all goes, and I'll leave you to, to either watch the talk or watch the film, or both. But she said, she made an, an important point, and she said, as a historian, we are taught that there are two commodities in, in history. There are facts and there are opinions. And whereas facts are well documented and are evidence based, opinions are subject to be challenged and debated and discussed. And everything that is said forms, it feels, uh, falls into one of those two categories. She said, but the problem is that that doesn't allow for a third category. And that is the category of lies. You see, because if you call a lie just somebody else's opinion, it means that it's something that's worthy of debate and discussion. And it's an alternative point of view. Or, to, co to quote the phrase, it's an alternative fact. But that's not the case. And there are many things that people say that are pernicious, that are hateful, that are spiteful, that are based on lies. And they're not worthy of discussion. They're not worthy of debate. They're not there to be refuted. They are just simply contrary to the truth and untrue. And they are, do not have the same status as documented, evidence-based facts. And they certainly they don't have the, the status of expert opinions from people that were there at the time. And she says the problem we've had with Holocaust denial and anti-Semitism is that we've tried to paint it, 
put it into one of those two categories of opinion or fact. And when you do that, you end up in a very dark, murky place. When in fact, they're not like that at all. They are, quite simply, lies. This is something we've, we've, we've had to come used to over the last um, year or two, where, where um, truth has been often, often muddled up um, with conflicting bits of information or conflicting opinions, when in fact, actually, it's just simply not true. And the idea that you can repeat it and repeat it and repeat it until people start believing it, and until it, it starts to become true, has got to be put to rest. And like I say... That is something we do when we when during the Megillah when we when we say the name Homon. We need to blot it out, stamp it out, and call it for what it is. The second concept that I talked about was concealment, and as I say, it's the, the connection between the the custom of dressing up is obviously very clear. We're pretending to be who we're not. And what we're saying is, who we are on the outside isn't necessarily reflected what we are on the inside. And that's kind of cute, isn't it? Um, you know, when we tie that in the concept of simcha, that people often seem to be happy when in fact deep down inside they're not. Or not everyone is, is who they, they think they are and we all put on masks in social situations and so on. And that's kind of cute. But actually there's a much darker, deeper um, explanation. And again, it comes back to anti-Semitism. Anti-Semitism often dresses us up to be dresses itself up to be something it isn't to gain an air of legitimacy. Unfortunately, in, in today's society, we've got wrapped up, got caught up in this concept of identity politics. We judge people based on their behaviour. We we categorise people based on their behaviour, I should say. We don't look at people's ethnicity anymore or their, their, their citizenship or where they come from. We don't talk about African-Americans or, or, or Anglo-Irish or, 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 or whatever. We, we define people by who they sleep with, who they vote, how they voted, leave or remain. We're not judging people by, um, by what they are. We're judging them by how they seem. And that's very fickle. Because people can behave in different ways in different circumstances, or even behave in different ways in the same circumstances at different occasions. We've all had good days and bad days. There's this fear now of calling things what they are for fear of offending people. And it's not even the people themselves that are raising these fears. It's, it's people being afraid for other people. Being afraid of offending other people, being afraid for those people and trying to defend the rights of people that perhaps don't care. Anti-Semitism uses that dressing up. And it's no surprise that in an age of, 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 of identity politics, where people are, are, are unclear as to what they stand for anymore, based on what we were saying earlier about truths and, and facts and, and alternative facts, it's no surprise that there's an upsurge in, in hatred and, and, and fear. Because people are no longer standing for anything. They just know what they don't want. And they're running away from what they don't like. And when people are running away, they'll run towards anything. And that's scary. Um, both in a psychological sense, when people are running away from traumatic experiences, and, and, and both in, in a behavioural, um, philosophical, a psychological sense as well. Concealment, the dressing up, shows us that on Purim, things aren't always what they seem, but we need to spot what they are. We need to peel away the layers. Like Deborah Lipstadt said in her video, she said these Holocaust deniers would often be dressed in smart suits, have an academic um, respectability, produce a footnote-laden, reference-laden um, research uh, material. But when you looked at the sources that they were referring to, these sources would often be fabricated or even just blatantly non-existent. 
They, they wouldn't come out dressed in SS uniforms, waving swastika flags. They dressed themselves up as historical revisionists and gave themselves that air of respons respectability when in fact what they were trying to do was not revise history but just justify their own irrational anti-Semitism. Which, as I say, is not something that's easy to do. I really hate to put a dampener on your Purim, and I hope I haven't. But as I said in the previous video, there are a lot of um, adult, complex, deep ideas behind the holiday of Purim. Um, and yes, we try and sort of adapt it for the children and, and, and try and sort of um, dress it up um, as, 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 as something for the kids. But I, I really do hope that that doesn't get that, that the true inner meanings don't get lost, and that you're able to to celebrate the festival and to 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 to, to, to be inspired by the festival um, for for what it is, the deeper meanings as well as the the fun stuff. So um, I'll say Shabbat Shalom and a Purim Sameach, a happy, healthy Purim, and please don't get too drunk.